pretend it's not there. No problem. No problem. Thanks, Heather. Hello, everybody, and good evening. I'm Susan Delaney. Uh, I see a couple of familiar faces. You're all very welcome, both to PSI and to the first in our series of lectures run by the Special Interest Group in Death, Dying, Bereavement. Uh, the SIG has been running now for, for many years, but this is the first time that we've, we've put our toes into this uh, arena. Uh, and I suppose there was a fear that maybe nobody would come, so we're delighted to see you here. Uh, and we hope that it's going to be a benefit. The idea being that, the, the, that within the SIG we have a lot of expertise um, in various aspects of loss, and we just felt it was an opportunity to give it away first to, to psychologists and psychology students, and maybe then we look at doing something for, for the general public after that. Um, so we have a series. Um, you'll have gotten from Heather the list. We'll have John McAvoy next week, followed by Ursula Bates, uh, myself and Paul Dalton. So my hope is that you'll come to as many of them as you can. They are all standalone, but we really would appreciate if you come and support us. And give us some feedback. If there's other areas that you'd be interested in, we can, we can see what we can do. If you're not a member of the Special Interest Group and you'd like to be, uh, if you just want to either give me your details um, or you can email them to me later. I'll leave the details with Heather and then we'll put you on the list. One of the advantages of being a member of the SIG is you get library alerts from um, the Irish Hospice Foundation, which is where I work, which has a very extensive library and we get grand updates on what's new in the research. So it's a nice benefit if that's of interest to you. For our first night, I'm very pleased to welcome a good colleague, Dr. Helen Greeley is here with us, Director of Psychology and Support Services in Cancer Care West, so up from Galway tonight. Um, Helen teaches on our postgraduate course in IHF on bereavement studies. She does the module on models of grief, um, so probably knows more about this topic than anybody else here. Um, and she's an engaging speaker, so we're looking forward to a good evening. Uh, thanks, Helen, for coming, and thanks for kicking it off, and I'll hand over to you. Thanks. So thank you Susan for that introduction and um, you're all very welcome and I'm here, I feel I'm, like I'm a bit of a guinea pig because I don't know how this is going to go uh, but uh, a couple of months ago Susan and Paul Dalton contacted me from SIG and said would we consider doing a series of talks on various aspects of grief and loss and um, I, we were asked to submit various lecture titles and I submitted a few of them and this is the one that was picked. So I suppose this is really just a kind of a, a meander through what's happened to bereavement knowledge over the last probably 80, 90 years. And uh, the kind of layout of the talk is that I'm going to talk to you about the different models that are there today, there today where they came from. But also I guess just to have it says two hours, but I'm actually not going to talk for two hours because I don't think I'm able to do that. But I will talk for probably about an hour. And then I thought we'd break into some small groups and just generate a bit of a discussion because I think it's nice to, you know, you have lots of knowledge yourself about this area. And uh, I suppose that can be an advantage and it can also be a disadvantage um, because it's an advantage to have our own losses. The one thing about, like I've worked with people with all different kinds of trauma in their lives but the one thing about bereavement is that we know it's happened to us already and we know it probably will happen again so it's common to everyone we meet and it's also common to ourselves and that brings its pluses but it can also bring its disadvantages including bias about how we see people's grief and what we think about grief ourselves and how that influences our response to people we work with so I suppose I just wanted to, at the, to at the end, set some time aside to talk about those kinds of topics and the kinds of challenges that we meet when we work in this area. Um, so that's really the, the kind of uh, the kind of basic layout of the talk. And uh, as Susan says, I work with Cancer Care West now. Um, in 1998, I completed a longitudinal study of bereavement response in the west of Ireland, and um, that was published for a PhD thesis. And then. Uh, so I've always worked on bereavement care since about 1982 and it's always been a particular interest of mine probably for personal reasons originally uh, so I went into it and now I suppose I've just become more and more interested in it over the years and um, for our work now in Cancer Care West we offer support services and psychological uh, therapy to people with cancer and their families and that is right from the time of diagnosis up 
to and including whatever the outcome is, is including bereavement care for relatives of people who die from cancer. So I suppose we, we try and support them wherever they're at in that journey. And uh, so still work in bereavement and I guess this work in cancer care has been very challenging because it's very different because I was so used to working with people who were bereaved who had already gone through the death experience whereas now I'm working with people who are facing their own death sometimes and that's a different challenge and uh, so I saw that it's, it's brought me new insights into how people respond to loss and grief in their lives um, so that's if you want to interact while I'm giving the talk, I'm very happy to. You can stop me if you want to, and I'll certainly be putting some time aside at the end to talk about uh, and to discuss what I've talked about. So really, the, the talk this evening is to cover these three kind of areas, offer you a bro brief overview of the main theories of grief and loss, consider the theoretical foundations which have contributed to designing effective clinical interventions in the present decade. I think that's very important because I think one of the big things about earlier theories of grief is that they very often were not grounded on good research and uh, I think often we brought our, the people about their own biases to that kind of work about how they had responded to their own grief and so it's very important that we do what we say uh, what we say to grieving people is based on some good research and what can the clinical interventions arise from that and then I suppose the other thing is that I'm very aware of the kind of biases we bring to this kind of work. So I want us to be aware of the fact that our own personal experiences of loss and grief, how do they influence the way we respond to stories of loss in the clients we work with? So those are kind of three broad areas that I thought I might just touch on this evening. So I'm going to start with some definitions like every good psychologist and I thought we'd look at a lot of words used in this area and I want to just, I suppose, to, to talk about what they mean to me. And bereavement is the loss of a loved one through death. So my talk this evening is only going to be about bereavement, as in bereavement caused by the death of someone we love. Um, sorry, no, going the wrong way. Grief is the feeling state or emotional response to loss, the apex of the mourning process, and incorporates diverse psychological and physical manifestations. And that's very important because... Um, when I started reading about grief and loss first, which was way back in the, the late 1970s, um, I think I, I didn't realise really at the time that there were so many different words around loss and grief, and often people get confused about what all that means. So I think that it's very important to realise that grief is really about everything when you're grieving. And I think it can affect every single system that we have in our lives and everything about ourselves physically, psychologically, spiritually, emotionally, that they're all in there together. And there is nothing protected from grief when, you, when somebody's gone through it. And then loss is being deprived of something, being deprived of something invested with emotional energy by the self. That's a very famous um, psychologist who works in this area called David Kazan. And he actually works in loss and grief caused by cancer diagnosis. So I suppose he's uh, someone I've become more and more interested in as time has gone on and I, as I've been working in that area myself. And then mourning is the process of adaptation to loss with particular reference to the cultural and social rituals of the society in which we live and that's really important because i just carry this as, as an aside when i was doing my research in in the 1990s one of the things that i found out by accident i didn't set out to study it but uh, in the people that i was talked to who had been bereaved and there was a longitudinal study so they were interviewed at um, uh, six months, 13 months, two years and then two and a half years. And one of the amazing things about that study was that uh, because it was done in the west of Ireland, about 50% of the, of the group um, opted to have a wake at home. And uh, a wake at home, for any of you who wouldn't be familiar with it, is where you lay the body out at home in the house where they lived and you allow, I suppose, usually you allow people to come in and spend time with the person and with the family. And uh, so that can go on usually overnight and might go on for about 24 hours and sometimes longer. And one of the things I found out, and it really strikes me because of this thing about mourning, is really important to think that uh, the people who had opted to have a wake at home, as time went on in their bereavement, they had lower levels of intense grief, they had lower levels of depression, they had gr better coping skills. And as that came out of the research, when I went back for the last interview, I talked about, you know, why did you opt to have a wake? And the one thing that was common to all the people in the study was that anybody who had opted to have a wake at home did so because they wanted to have control over the situation. And that whole thing about control, I think, is something that runs through all the theories I'm going to talk about this evening. Because, in fact, um, 
I think a loss of control around grief and loss is a huge issue for people and anything they can do to make bring back even little bits of control is often very important. That's why if you're doing something like working with someone who's grieving, very often it's important for to them to actually look at ways, I feel so out of control, is there any small bit of my life I can control at the moment? So that was a very interesting finding at the time. And um, and the other thing that was really interesting about that bit of research was that the people who didn't opt to awake at home, most of them wanted to have one, but they didn't have one mainly for kind of cultural reasons like the undertaker said to them, the house, you know, your mother, it was, uh, I always think it was one person, uh, a man whose wife had died, and uh, the undertaker said to him, you know, said to the children, your mother wouldn't be happy to be laid out at home because it needs doing up the house. Now, probably so in the west of Ireland you get away with saying something like that. I don't know where else you get away with it, but uh, that kind of stuff. Um, so often, actually, people wanted to have one, but they didn't. They couldn't organise it to do it. And it's not that it's a prescription. It doesn't. It isn't that it would work for everyone. But for people who want it, it seems like it's a very important option to give. And certainly, in fact, interestingly, in the last five or ten years, uh, wakes at home have become more prevalent again in the west of Ireland. So it's an interesting kind of about turn that we've done. Um, but I certainly think it's about that issue of control. So when we lose something through death, when we lose someone through death, what is the what significance? And the significance of any loss event is comprised of factors relating to the, the person who died, the person who's grieving, and finally the overall context in which it occurs. So, for example, uh, I always amused at some levels and I suppose annoyed at another level when I talk, work, read about bereavement and loss and so on because I think loss and grief is all about a relationship. I don't think it's the name of the person who dies that's really important. I think what's really important is what could the relationship they have with this person. And the reason I say that is that I worked with a woman a long, long time ago, probably one of the first women I ever worked with uh, when I, I had a private practice up to about five or six years ago. And uh, this woman was uh, a woman whose brother had died and he was very revered in the community where he lived and I actually kind of, because I live in a small area, the Ireland is small, never mind Galway, and I kind of knew of this guy who had died and this woman came to see me and she was uh, very angry when she came for her first uh, t appointment and uh, she said to me that what was really getting to her was that everyone was so sad her brother had died and this woman was in her 70s but she said what really annoyed her was that this, this brother had abused her when they were children and she'd never felt safe enough to say it to anybody when he was alive so now she was coming to uh, vent her feelings I suppose really basically but she said everyone thought he was a loving brother to all his siblings but he wasn't a loving brother to her and it struck me forcefully about the relationship because even though he was called her brother he didn't have a brother really a relationship with her so I always think because one of the things I believe one of the things that I said one of the last bits of my talk is about what are the needs of bereaved people? And one of their big needs is not to be judged. I think that's a huge thing because I think that bereavement makes us very visible. When we're grieving in our communities here, like the community where I live, if you're grieving, everyone you suddenly become very visible and everyone has a comment to pass. Now, are you doing it the right way? Are you doing it the wrong way? Are you grieving too much? Are you going to the grave too often? Are you going at all? And so it seems to me really, really important that we look at the relationship behind the person who died, what's underneath that. Because it's just being called someone's father or mother or husband or wife or whatever it is, is not enough. It's about what kind of relationship did you have with that person. Because that's essentially what we grieve. I think all the theories have that in common. That they all essentially come down to that one point, that we grieve about relationships. We, it's not really the name of the person who died. So I suppose just to look at like where have we come from, and this is I suppose the the, the title of the lecture is from Freud to Neymar, and I guess we come really from a place where there's been a long search for a theoretical framework to really help us to understand why people respond to loss the way they do, and it's been a major focus of of researchers and theorists in the area of loss and grief for most of the last century, and when we think about Freud, Freud came to it by accident really, he wasn't really that interested in bereavement per se, or the bereavement response, he was more interested in looking at depression and where it came from, but from that time on, once he started to write about it, and once he started to think about why do people react the way they do, the, it gained more and more kind of uh, popularity in the, in the academic literature, and that has continued, and it's a real and I would say probably 10% of every day I work and probably 5% of every day I don't work, I spend thinking about what this answers, this question. Why do people respond to losses the way they do? That question, why? And I don't think we've, I think it's got lots of different answers. I don't think there's any one answer for, for why people respond the way they do. 
So we look at the early, uh, early last century, the early 20th century. Um, I suppose most early writers like Freud and Bowlby and Parks, interested in the area of loss and grief, have adopted a theoretical framework involving stages and or phases of emotional responses to grief and loss. So it's very much a prescription about going through certain phases or stages of grief and always coming out the other side. And I was very upset recently, I was telling Susan that before I, before I, when I was talking to her earlier on, my daughter is, 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 has done a medical degree in Galway and about four or five years ago when she was in, in probably fifth med, she came home one day and obviously grief and loss gets talked about a lot in our house because that's what I work in. And um, she, they had had a, a lecture from um, um, a psychologist actually, which, more, which was even more upsetting for me. And this psychologist said to them about Kubler Ross and the stages of grief and about the stages of grief, that's how you go through them. And I said, Did you say anything about newer things that are happening? And she said, No. And she said, Mum, I knew you wouldn't be happy because I hear you talking about the changes. And she said, All he talked about was people go through stages of grief when they're dying and people go through stages of grief when they're grieving. And so I'm thinking to myself, Here's a whole new 70 plus amount of doctors who are going to be turned out in the community in the next 10 years and maybe a lot of them will be GPs and they're still being taught this kind of stuff. So there's a very good reason for us to be doing talks like this and for us to be getting the information out there that actually grief and loss is a bit more complicated than just going through a set of stages, mm -hmm. a bit like um, a cycle race where you go through stage one and you're finished with it. So if you go through the stage of shock, that's it, your shock should be over. When we know from clients that we talk to and people we work with, in fact, shock can last a long time and can come and go at various levels. So it really annoys me to think that we're still doing this kind of stuff and we're not getting it out there. Um, so what were the major theories pre-1990s? And so the major theories are people like psychoanalytic model, which comes from uh, Sigmund Freud, and uh, I suppose really that was the start of uh, two things. One is that we owe him a huge debt of gratitude because he brought attention to grief and loss, which really wasn't really been talked about up to that time. But the downside is that it became a medical model. And in this prescription of writing out how people should go through their grief and this whole thing about, you know, that um, it's a set of stages and you, the goal of those stages when you go through them is to detach yourself from the person who died. I really cringe now. I started working with bereaved people in 1982 and I cringe because we follow, I follow those models religiously. And the amount of time I got, I made almost clients say goodbye to somebody when they didn't want to do it. And of course, it's only through doing that kind of stuff, so that's what led me to my own research because it just didn't fit because what clients were telling me and what I was reading the research, there was kind of a big gap. So, and we all like to have the answers. I mean, the reason probably when I look at myself, why do I work in bereavement? I suppose a lot of it is about we'd like to help people to get through this trauma that happens in their lives. But I mean, this prescription stuff, I suppose, has good and bad attached to it. But that whole thing about getting people to say goodbye, the aim of a grief journey was always to detach. It was the absolute ne necessity to do that, I think, did a damage. Not that, that it can be a goal, but that it is the only goal. That is the problem that really came about because of that. And then that led on to Colin Murray Parks, sorry, to... Bowlby and John Bowlby as we all know you owe him a huge debt of gratitude if for nothing ex except that he brought attention to the fact that children grieve too which is really important and has had a huge influence in how we organise children for example to be in hospitals but the other thing is that I guess I always think Bowlby when I think of Bowlby I think one sentence that I, I use sometimes in, in, in the lecture I give in the, in the Hospice Foundation and it is this that like if we didn't have attachments we wouldn't have grief that it's all about attachment so like the reason we grieve is because we have attached ourselves to somebody and they've because have a bond to us. And when that attachment is changed or severed in some way or broken, then our body responds to that, our mind responds to it and our psyche responds to it. So I think Bowlby, for no other reason, even though again he was a very much a stage man and he was very much influenced by Freud and he felt as well that the, sta the, the goal of all grief therapy and the goal of grief work was really to help yourself to detach from the person who died. And so that became more into kind of, but it, like one of the downsides of his theory is that it was very much based around children and loss and very much kind of depended on, on kind of evidence from kind of the animal kingdom as well. And I mean, can we transfer that stuff across? Can we say that we grieve the same as animals? So, <clears throat> and then we come to Colin Murray Parks and psychosocial transitions. And again, very important 
author and writer in the area of grief and loss. But again, would have been very, really, I suppose, dynamic in the sense that he brought in the idea that it's about a transition. And grief is really about a transition because we are transiting from one part of our lives onto another uh, and to a new landscape, really, that we might know a lot about. And I often think of people I work with now when I say to them, you know, what's the most difficult thing about this for you? For a lot of our young people who have get cancer or who are going to die from cancer, the really difficult thing for them is that it's their first real trauma that they can recognise. So I think that that transition to getting yourself to know yourself in a new way, that can be a very big thing. So um, Colin Murray Parks sort of talked about transitions and the fact that we have to actually form new relationships with people but again very much along the lines of like it's about detaching from the person who died and this thing about detachment became so important it got so enmeshed in all that theory that it really became the goal of most grief therapists and people who worked to bereaved people in say the 70s and 80s and then we have Kubler Ross who is not strictly a model of bereavement and loss but as any of you would know here uh, worked again with people who had terminal illness and her model has been really criticised in more recent years, um, and I'm not going to go into that now because I don't I don't want to get kind of sidetracked into that. But I guess the the, whole, the one that what I do want to say to you is this: is that that stage model was very prescriptive, and the real damage in that model in terms of bereavement was that it was then transferred onto grieving people as well who had actually experienced a death. And she, when she before she died, she wrote a, a book with David Kessler, and she said in that book that in fact she never meant for her theory to be used with people who were grieving a death that was actually meant to be focused on people who were dying from terminal illness. And but again, this prescription, this stage model of grief, uh, you know, that we go through, um and uh you it usually starts with shock, goes through all the emotional stuff, often includes anger and resentment and eventually leads to resolution or adaptation, uh, or recovery. And again, it's very much about getting better, making the breed better from what has happened to them. And whether that's what we should be really doing or not. And certainly a lot of people as they came along after those early writers were saying this isn't what bereaved people are saying to us. And I do think that's what led to the greatest change is that people who went out to start working with people who were grieving were saying this doesn't fit. This is not actually what grieving people want to do. They don't want to cut their ties to the person who died. They don't want to say goodbye forever. They might want to say so long for now. But they actually don't want to let go forever. I think that's a really kind of that's where a lot of it came from. And then you have William Worden who took kind of a different approach because he talked about the tasks of mourning, and there were essentially four tasks. And Worden revised his theory in the 90s, and I, so I guess in a way, um, again he would start off saying you know that it was very much about uh, adapting and letting go, but he kind of said we had to his his latest theory is that you have to emotionally relocate the person in your present life. So it's putting in that idea of that we still have a relationship with the person who died, just not the one that we would like to have because they would like them to be alive. And I just mentioned the bottom there, integrative model, because that's from Catherine Saunders, who actually died from cancer herself about five or six years ago. But her model, I think, is the start of the new new phase of models, even though it's very much it's a phasal model, and she's five phases, very like Kubler Ross and, and Freud and, and Bowlby. But one thing she did was she brought in the idea of that there were mediating factors. So things like the age we are when we have our first loss, our social status, the kind of relationship we have with the person who died, the kind of social support we have, our own physical health. She brought all those things in as mediating factors. And that was a really step, big step forward. She did a study called the Tampa Study in the late 80s. And um, I, was thinking, I was in Florida about 15 years ago in Hodges, and we were, we were down in, um, in uh, Miami. And and we came home, or we were coming home, and we, we came up to stay for a couple of nights in Clearwater, which is not too far from Tampa. And uh, there was a guy in the bar, and I was I, I just always strikes it because she comes into my head when I, hear, when I heard this story. And uh, I said to him one night, the guy who was serving, I said, "Are you from Florida?" He said, "Honey, no one's from Florida." So I always think the people she used in her study in Tampa. I wonder where they were from because they probably weren't from Florida anyway. But she did a, a, st- a Tampa study, and that was with all kinds of people. It was with mothers and fathers partners, spouses, children, grandparents, and she developed this integrative model. I think her big contribution was that she brought in this idea about mediating factors. And she also talked about possible outcomes. And she had three possible outcomes. She had no change, so people went back to their old lives and really couldn't really discern that there was anything different about their lives. She had 
um, psychosocial growth, which is really, really interesting because now you have people like Linda Masham who write about resilience in loss and about the fact there can be growth in loss. And in fact, I had a newer research just published in the last two or three years. He's talking about how do people make growth out of their loss experiences and is that really one of the pluses in that whole area? But anyway, she talked about psychosocial growth and she also talked about abnormal responses and people that got stuck in their grief. So I think she was quite, you know, she was a bit ahead of her time uh, in what she said and it never really got very much published, which is a pity, I think, because I think there's a lot of stuff there that could have been used. And she also, of course, developed the grief experience inventory, which is a very 142 item scale that looks at bereavement responses. And I actually used it myself in my own study. So uh, when you can convince people to fill it in, it's just a bit too long for ease of, of giving out. But it's, it, was a, it was a very comprehensive um, kind of scale to use. Cause it looked at every single response to loss um, in terms of kind of individual responses. So what can we say about the early theories that I've just gone through? And I guess this is what's common to them. It's a series of stages, particularly including an end stage of recovery. So everyone must recover from their loss and they don't, it's not normal. And I guess that's something that really doesn't fit with clients that I work with. The absolute universality of the grief response. So again, like the woman I talked about whose brother had abused her and she was, she was relieved when he died uh, because she felt she could go off and talk about now what had happened to her. Her response was not universal and therefore we must be very careful of that. And uh, I'll tell you a funny story actually. When I was doing my study, I went out to see a woman who lived in East County Galway, and she had a big farm, a very big farm, and uh, she, her husband had died, and he kind of had been ill for five or six years, but he kind of lived, outlived his prognosis, and um, I went out to see her one November night, was, she was one of the first people I interviewed for the study, and uh, when I eventually found the house down this little boreen, um, and she went out the door and she said, come in and have a cup of tea, and I explained to her she'd agreed to come into the study to her GP and um, anyway she said you know I'm a bit of a fraud you shouldn't really be talking to me at all I thought I can't get anyone to talk to so I'll talk to him well because I couldn't find anyone to talk to about bereavement but anyway she said um, she said my husband and I were really unhappily married and I'm delighted he's dead just want to hear that start so anyway I said tell us a bit more about the story so she proceeded to tell the story and they had a long cantankerous relationship where they really never got on that well together and she was always hoping that he would die before her so that she could spend the money that he had accumulated over the years. And um, and she had three sons at home whom she wanted to get rid of, three adult sons. She didn't want them living there at home, kind of crapping her style. This woman now was in her late 60s, early 70s. So anyway, so I went off in business, we did the scales, and I came back to see her uh, about six months later. I came back in at two years and again at two and a half years or three years, I can't remember now. But anyway... Uh, when I came back the fourth time, one thing that really annoyed her was she said the priest in the village had often come out to them to, to try and keep them together and uh, not to be given kind of shame to the community. And uh, of course, she had never any notion of leaving because of land. She wasn't going to, to, to walk away from it. And um, But she said the priest, when he stood up to give the sermon, talked about their wonderful, happy marriage. And she said everyone in the village, it's called a village, it's just a collection of houses, but they called them that in the west of Ireland. Um, she said everyone in the village company like was shaking it was a terrible loss and you know we'll all be there for you. She said every single one of them knew just how unhappily married they were, but not one of them said it to me. And she was really all about that. When I came back three years later, uh, in between I come back but the last interview, um, she said to me, I'm very sad. And I said, What are you sad about? She said, I missed the rouse. So it taught me a very big lesson again. And that was just one comment and that even though she wasn't, she she missed, she was very lonely. And in fact, in that study, the thing that came out of that study for me was that when I said to people, what's the most difficult aspect of your grief? It was the loneliness of a loss of a close relationship, even if that relationship included arguments and rows. So it's interesting. And I guess that's why I always think we shouldn't be judging people. Um, the other thing about the early theories was that it applied to all in a linear fashion. So it's very, you know, you start at stage one and you get to stage five or stage four or any stages are in it and you're meant to arrive at the end of the line. And of course we know that people are not like that and they're not robotic in their responses and they come and go between responses all the time. And basically seen as a negative life event when in fact for some people bereavement can be a bit of a positive life event or can be aspects of it that are a bit positive. So again, that they were common kind of things in it. Failure to recover is pathological, and that word recovery, which I 
we don't like in the bereavement literature, I think we have to talk about adaptation over time because that's essentially what everyone's trying to do, or transitions over time. The necessity for severing the ties to the person who died, which again now is in popular parlance, wouldn't be seen at all as necessary and certainly not necessary to cut them completely. And I suppose the other big thing, and this is where I think the present research has grown out of, is that there was little or no empirical research and where it exists it was carried out with very specific populations, like Colin Murray Parks essentially worked with widows or psychiatric populations. And the, 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 we, we have very little research on how men grieve, in fact. And it's only in recent five or ten years that's starting to change. But we really didn't know how children grieved very well, apart from what Bowlby did, but actually go out and observe children and talk to them about what it's like to be grieving. A girl I worked with and I worked in private practice, um, the family referred to me because the, her, she, had, she had one brother. And this uh, boy got killed in the farm accident, which was extremely traumatic as she saw, saw it. And his arch was sur- severed in his arm and he bled to death before they got to the hospital. He bled out in the back of the car and she saw all this happen. So she was extremely traumatised apart from any grief and loss and all the rest of it. But her parents had actually always had a very poor relationship and this was kind of the last straw. And they decided to separate after about five or six years after the boy died. And um, she came to see me one day and she said, now I'm going to be the geek. So how long did my brother die, which was awful. And she said, I know for sure that if he, if, if I had died and he lived, they wouldn't be as sad as they are about him, because he was always a favourite child. She was about 15 or 16, she was in Sydney. But she said, now I'm going to be the geek whose parents were also separated because he died. So, I mean, she she really, in none of, no theory that I ever wrote or I ever read really applied to the stuff that was going on for her. She was so traumatised by what happened to her family. So, that's why I say when I say at the start, significance of the loss, the context in which it happens. And this actually happens a good bit to me in my work now, where you have two children in the family and one child gets sick. And the other child is really much more traumatised, I think, than there would be if it was a bigger family. That may or may not be the case, but that's just my sense of it from working with with the people that I work with now. So in these theories, grief is seen as a process, a series of stages or phases requiring completion, the result of a relationship that had to be relinquished and let go of, a negative life experience and possibly pathological outcomes. So that, in summary, is kind of what those early theories were said. So these are all models of linearity, finality and normalisation. And that is that grief eventually comes to an end, and if it does not, then it is seen as abnormal. So it's very prescriptive, and it's, they were very prescriptive in their descriptions. And the griever completes the stages or phases and lets go of the deceased, so it's like ticking the boxes. So what happened from the 1990s onwards? So I, get, I suppose prevailing models that I've just described up to the 20th century generally view grief as in a very specific way with particular characteristics attached to the event. Over time, clinicians realised that this formulation did not accurately or adequately reflect what grievers were thinking or feeling or what they were saying to people like me and people like you who kind of, they were saying, this is actually, I don't want to be saying goodbye to this person who died. I don't want to use the empty chair to say goodbye or do my unfinished business. I just don't want to do that. And so it came about that the prevailing models of grief at that time appeared inaccurate, incomplete and even biased in some instances. Um, and that certainly would inform us I thought about what happened afterwards. So the primary problem with the early models was and is that they are unable to account for individual differences among grievers. So why is it that if you have got five siblings who experience the death of their father, that you have five different responses to that loss? In the early models of grief, what would be expected would be that they would go through the stages or phases that I described, and then that they would come out the other side. And in fact, we know that that's not happens. That sometimes people get stuck in their grief. That sometimes people hardly the grief seems to impact them at all, and they get on fine with their lives. And that some people just go through what we consider the actual grief that was described in the early models. That is, they go through a number of kind of various feeling stages, and they come out the other end. And I think the problem with those early models is that if people were responding differently than what was expected, then uh, that was seen as pathological. And that's why I say to you often, I think my last slide tonight is that I think the role of non-judgment and bereavement is very important. I saw a girl this morning whose father died from cancer four weeks ago. And um, in the service that I work in, 
and my colleague was seeing her mother before the father died to talk about how she was going to tell the children the father was going to die. In fact, his illness became very progressive very quickly. He died before she found out two days beforehand that he was going to die. And um, she said to me this morning, you know, this, if she's really upset because she didn't get, she get, a, get a chance to say goodbye to her dad. She thinks uh, she knew for about two days and never got to have that conversation that she wanted to have with him. And she said, you know, she said, I knew he had cancer for the last year, but I always thought I was going to get better. That's what I was told. And um, but she said to me this morning, she's living in, a, in an apartment in Galway City and her mother obviously lives in the family home. And she wants to spend every night home with her mother. But the mother is terrified that this girl is going to um, not be able to get on with her life. So the mother saying, you must stay in your own apartment tonight. So she says to me today, what do you think? So in an effort to be non-directive, I said to her, what would you like to do? And she said, I want to stay at home because I'm close to my dad there at the moment. I feel that's where he is and I just want to be there. And I said, you must follow your gut instinct. If that's where you want to be, then that's maybe what you should do. So I just thought, this is it. you Because know, she already felt like she would have been really judged as if she was kind of going off the wall and uh, not being allowed to grieve. So following gut instinct and not feeling judged, it seems to me, are two very important rules in bereavement that we don't really pay enough attention to. Um, so beginning in the late 80s, we have people like Margaret and Wolfgang Strieber, uh, Workman and Silver, Nehemiah and Class began questioning the value of the early models. And the really seminal paper that started all this thought was a paper by uh, Workman and Silver called The Myths of Coping with Loss. And that is the paper, I suppose, that really kicked off how we started to look at grief. So that was published, I think it was 1989 or 1988, and uh, really challenged some of the really deeply held myths about grief, about stages, about the fact that they always had to lead to recovery, about the universality of loss that everyone had to go through it in the same way. And they really brought about this kind of huge change in bereavement thought. And they, I suppose the thing that the reason we're doing these talks is because we think now that people are still using the old stages and not realising that we've moved on a lot and are thinking about grief and loss. It's not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I don't say that there's nothing valuable in Freud or Bowlby or Parks. I think there's huge value in what they did. But we must be aware of the fact that things have moved on a bit too. So what are the major theories in the 90s? And they were really three that I wanted to just mention. Stress and coping model, which is the whole impact of bereavement as a stressful life event that requires resources to cope with it. And we know that how do we how do we kind of um, you know kind of describe stress? And stress really, I suppose, the definition of stress that we use most often is that an event becomes really really stressful if we think that we don't have the required resources to cope with the event the demands that are being met on us. So we know, for example, in early bereavement, particularly if the death is very unexpected or very traumatic in some way. Uh, we know that we don't have the resource very often to cope with that immediately. That that's something we've got to develop over time. And that makes perfect sense to me. That, of course, if something's throwing you very quickly, you don't kind of suddenly say, oh, God, I can do this, no problem. That's not what grief is like at all, actually. So stress and coping seems to me bring a lot to this research, as do, as do approaches like cognitive therapy, where we're looking at how, about how we think about things, and I'll say about that later on. And then we've got, I suppose, a really similar uh, model called dual process. And that was devised uh, by um, name I'm now, Margaret Strieber and help me, Susan, the, the German guy. He was, yeah, sure. They, so they're devised by uh, Hank Schutt and uh, the Strebers. And basically what that says is that it's a bit like a seesaw. And if you can imagine that they talk about two kind of um, I suppose extremes. One is uh, the loss orientation and that is very early on in bereavement essentially where you're very caught up with the loss event. So for example you're very much thinking about the type of death it was, uh, the fact maybe you had no warning, going through the funeral rituals, going through the last conversation that was had with the person who died, going through you know, all things around the loss event, how you coped yourself. And the other side of that seesaw is what they call restoration orientation or future orientation. And that is really the bit of it that's caught up with like tr looking at the future and the present and living in the moment and trying to kind of cope every day. So getting the children out of school, paying the bills, learning how to change a cloak if you're a woman you've never done before, or learning how to load the washing machine or whatever it is, the skills that you didn't have to do before. And what, what kind of mediates those two extremes is a thing called oscillation. And that's the kind of the, the, I suppose the process by which you, we pay attention to one side or the other. So this was really a very much a stress model in a way because it was looking at, but also trying to explain what happens to people when they're grieving. 
So of course, when someone's just newly bereaved, they are cut up with the loss of meant. They are thinking about, did I get to say goodbye? Did I have a row with the person before they died? You know, was there on his out business? Have I enough money to live on? So you go all those concerns, and you're not really thinking about how am I going to be in a year's time, or if you are just very fleetingly. So it seems to me that this model really moved our thinking on about the fact, and this again can explain explain individual differences, because obviously sometimes we we uh, I suppose we, we don't, you know, we, we don't all respond in the same way. So maybe sometimes people get really uh, caught up in the last event and maybe they get stuck there and they can't move on from thinking about the grief. So at the moment, for example, I'm working with a woman whose husband died for just two years this month, actually, and the re- she's extremely stuck in her grief, but there's a very valid reason. The reason she's stuck in her grief is that, A, she thought her husband was going to get better from the cancer and she wasn't really told the truth or didn't hear it. Maybe she was told it, but she didn't hear the story from the consultant. And she, um, the other thing is that her husband died in terrible pain in a big eight-bedded ward in the regional hospital in Galway and they, they were unable to control his pain. And so palliative care were very involved and the hospital, in fact, the staff of the ward had to have a debriefing session because it was so traumatic for them who didn't know him at all except for minding him. So you can imagine what it's like for this woman who witnessed that. So a lot of her grief and a lot of her being stuck is about the trauma of what happened to him. And so again, that's not that's outside the normal response, but a lot of it's about tr- trying to get to work through that trauma and look at it. And the other thing that's really interesting about that client is that she can't find her husband anywhere. For her, he went into the ground, he died, and now he's nowhere. So she has no sense of any continuing bond with him at all. And she's very crossed him for dying and leaving her, which is another added dimension to it. So it seems to me that she can't, she she just keeps going over and over and over um, this kind of, the whole thing about the day he died and how he died and what happened in the hospital. And I've tried to do some of Catherine Shear's work with her, um, which is looking at complicated grief and maybe how to move people on. And this woman is very resistant to anything you do with her. And in some ways I've said to her, you know, what's, I started to say to her lately, you know, what function does this have for you? Where, where, where does it keep you when you keep thinking about it like this? So you've got a two, two-track model from Ruben, uh, which is in the kind of late 80s, early 90s. And that, again, is this, a bit like dual process, looking at the two tracks that run simultaneously, the kind of whole you know, physical side of grief and also about, uh, the emotion and the continuing bond bit. And that's when the, this word about having a relationship with somebody after they die or a changed relationship, that's where that came into the kind of literature. And now the more newer models, the ones we're working with at the moment are the ones that are being written about now, I guess. And so there are four of the last of probably different bits and ones, but the ones I wanted to just mention tonight are this continuing bonds model and meaning making, both of which really go together, I think. So I guess continuing bonds does what it says in the 10. Uh, it's about trying to look at grief and loss as having a change relationship with somebody, but not an ended relationship. So in other words, that you work with clients to get them to see that they can still have a relationship with the person who died if they want to. And that, in some or other, that continuing bond is very important. And it seems to me the whole role of cognitions is really important in this theory, because obviously sometimes people choose to do things like uh, Gloria Hunterford's daughter died from cancer a couple of years ago, and she wrote a book and she had this thing about feathers. And every time she saw a white feather, she felt that was her daughter interacting with her. The thing is, she chose to interpret it like that. And sometimes I think clients choose to interpret things in certain ways. Whether she totally believes that those white feathers are messages from her daughter, say I'm still around or I'm minding you or I'm beside you or whatever the story is. And it seems to me clients look for those kind of messages sometimes and choose to interpret what happens in certain ways. So it's, I think a lot of bereavement and outcome and, and how we cope with bereavement is about how do we choose to interpret what happens to us on a daily basis. Um, there was this woman I worked with whose son took half an ecstasy tablet and died and his friend took the other half and nothing happened to him. And after this lad died in the post-mortem, they discovered that he had a, a bit of a, um, a dicky heart and that in fact, you know, he, w- he was quite vulnerable to do something like that because he took the ecstasy tablet, then in fact it, it caused him to have a heart attack and die. And uh, she was really angry with God and uh, she saw herself as a very good living woman who really didn't deserve this. But one thing she said to me was, I go to bed every night and I pray to God that I'll dream about this boy who died. And that's the only thing God can give me now and he won't give it to me because I never dream about him. And um, 
her husband so and she said she couldn't find him anywhere she, he wasn't anywhere in the world as far as she was concerned because she could never dream about him and she could never anything that happened that was good she didn't see this coming from him whereas her husband in contrast every good thing that happened in their lives after this boy died he saw it as a gift from the son who died so it's very much about interpretation and that's really important I don't think enough made of the role of cognitions in bereavement today actually I think we need to do a bit more work on that in terms of how we see people who are grieving um, and then meaning making and this is the work of Robert Nehemiah that is up on the title of the lecture and Robert Nehemiah he came to give a, a, a day long workshop in Dublin about two years ago came for three years ago and a very very prolific writer a uh, very challenging guy in the way he thinks about grief and loss but he has really embraced the whole idea of narrative therapy and making sense of the loss and some or other to actually come to terms with, with losses or to make to adapt to them over time then in fact um, we have to in some or other get to accommodate them in our lives we have to reform ourselves and the world around the person who died and around this event that's now happened so uh, Robert Neumar, I suppose, has really a lot of stuff written about him today and he's writing a lot of stuff himself and it's all based on evidence with clients that he works with and with populations that he works with. So it's very well researched and very well funded research in the States, I guess. Whether we can apply to Ireland is a whole other question, some of the stuff that he's saying. But I think it's very important, this whole thing about that you have to spend some time making sense of the loss. Maybe that's what the stages of grief were doing that I talked about earlier on that now some had some dirty water around them maybe that's what actually they're doing maybe what, that's what all those stages and phases are about maybe they're trying to make sense of the loss that's happened and you go through that process to do it and loss of assumptions something I just want to talk about myself so I'll come back to that at, towards the end of the talk and then range of response loss I just want to mention a lady called Linda Masham who was in, in Galway or in Dublin again a few years ago all of this uh, organised with the Hospice Foundation and a uh, very important um, talks about a lot about the range of response loss and the word she's brought into the literature that I just want you to be aware of is this word called resilience and then in fact a lot of her work is around looking at how are we resilient to our loss and of course we have a very good example of that for example because how often have you heard people saying to you clients you work with or even people you know in your own life if someone told me I'd survive this I'd have said no way I won't get through this and I have so that very simple statement actually really highlights what she's saying that people are more resilient than they think they are and in fact through loss there can be growth making because in fact we can learn things about ourselves that give us a bit of solace and I think, you know, I've, I'm pretty proud of myself because actually I managed to get through that. I did manage to learn to do things I used to always leave to my husband or my wife. I did manage to do things that I thought I would never do. Um, so I think that's a very big thing because that whole thing about bringing in the positive aspects of grief really come from people like Linda Masham who is bringing in that whole thing. But it's not a negative life event always that there can also be positive things attached to it. So I think the way we think about grief and loss has really changed because of people like that. So what has happened in the last two decades, and particularly in the last decade, and I think this is the, the main kind of change, a shift away from purely intrapersonal way of looking at grief to interpersonal, the whole role of relationship. From clinical pictures, to looking at the whole biopsychosocial aspects of grief. So what happens to us as a whole person? And away from just describing what happens to people, so you go through all these stages, to what are the mediating factors that influence how we go through the grief? So there are lots of mediating factors, and people like Strieber and Jewel Process and, uh, and Ruben, who wrote the two-track model, they, a lot of them would talk about what makes people vulnerable to poor outcomes. And the big, I suppose, search now is like, how do you identify people at risk of, the, of, of developing complicated grief? I know Susan's lecture in about three or four weeks' time is going to be around complicated grief. I think that's really important, because, in fact, the reality is that most of the research says to us that only about 33% of grieving people require support. That most two-thirds of people who are grieving go through grief on their own and go through their own support mechanisms and don't require professional or any kind of support to help. But there are a core group of, of between 33% and within that group there are about 15% who really do require bereavement therapy or care because their grief gets stuck in some way. So what are the factors that make that happen? I guess that's what we've got to look out for.
and maybe because people are vulnerable already maybe they've got a past history of psychiatric illness maybe they have a terribly poor relationship with the person who died maybe there's unfinished business there maybe they're in a state of transition themselves because maybe they just retired or their children were just born or whatever it is so i think that people who are in transition are often very vulnerable in grief um so I think those mediating factors have become really important in terms of helping us to define and to identify people who are at risk of poorer outcomes. So what do the contemporary theories tell us? Well, the first thing is that the grief response is not universal to all, that there are huge individual differences and we have to take them into account. That prolonged grief may not necessarily be pathological. That in fact, someone can have prolonged grief that takes longer to get through, but actually it doesn't mean that they're psychiatrically ill. That severing the bond is not necessary for healthy grief and in fact maintaining the bond may be a healthy response to grief. I'm going to come back to that in a second because there's a paper just published in Death Studies which actually talks a bit about that. Um, but anyway, the idea that this thing about cutting your ties and saying goodbye um, may not always be the only thing to do and that in fact do we still carry people with us even, even after they die. Um, the role of resilience and coping so very much of Linda Masham about kind of her whole uh, emphasis on that. The importance of identifying vulnerable people which has led to the development of scales. So we've lots of bereavement scales now that are available that help us to measure uh, if someone's grief is complicated and if it is complicated what might be leading to that and helping to identify people who have an enduring poor response to loss. And individual responses which may differ from the norm but may not be necessarily pathological. So an example of that I'm going to give you, which I think is kind of a funny story, but anyway it's a it's um two when I was doing my study, there was two women who lived very close to each other in a terrace of houses in Galway and they were both taking part in the study and the first woman I went to see um was uh, her husband had died very suddenly from a um a heart attack and literally dropped dead as we say, one night sitting in the chair at home. And um she was extremely distraught, they had no children and uh, they had a very close relationship. So I went to see her six months anyway, and she was um, very upset. And one of the two things really upset her, one was that um, the man next door hadn't come to the funeral, and they lived in this uh, terrace of houses. It was just a little uh, stone wall between the two paths going in and out, so they lived at two front doors to each other. And she said to me, do you think he didn't bother to come and I can't believe it, and so on. So of course I was trying to be a good researcher and not really get involved in what it all meant. And... Um, so anyway, uh, that that was one thing that really upset her. And I went back to see her when she was 13 months bereaved. And she was very upset because she said she'd met the guy, the neighbour, about three or four months after I had been there. Um, so she met him when he was about 10 months dead, this, this her husband. And um, he was going to the path and she was coming out. And he said, hello, Mary, we'll call her for the sake of argument. And how are you? And she said, fine. He said, how is John? And uh, she said, John died nine months ago or ten months ago. So she said to me, he was really shocked. Do you think he was putting it on? <laughs> I said, I don't know. But she said, what really struck me was this was a Galway in the 1990s, early 90s, and that someone could die, your neighbour, and you wouldn't know it. And when she started thinking about it, she said, I can see now why you wouldn't know, because no one talks to each other around here. And, um, you know, it was kind of she was very distressed about that lack of support as she saw but there was probably a valid reason for it but the other thing was another woman who was a nearly a neighbour of hers had come into the study in the meantime and this woman's husband also died very suddenly and the difference was that um, this woman, the, the second woman I'm talking about one of the things was she built a shrine in the graveyard and it was a huge uh, kind of adulation up at the grave every day probably two or four times a day and that went on for like a year or two after it and um but she met this other, my first lady one day walking down the road and I heard the story from both ends, in the, heard from the two of them at different times. And she says to my lady, you never go to the grave to tend the grave. And it's an awful mess up there. And But you need to worry, I'll clean it up for you. So my first lady was very distressed about this. She said to me, how dare her interfere with the grave? And she said, I don't go to the grave because actually John is here in the sitting room with me tonight. And this is where he is for us. And I said, I don't need to go to the grave to be close to him. And I, but I don't want anyone to interfere with the grave either. Whereas the first woman, for her, the only place she could find her husband was in the graveyard. <laughs>
So I think it's very, very important because they were two very different responses. And in fact, both those women went on over the course of time to have very kind of normal responses to grief and they did adapt to it over time. But at that time, you would say they had two very different responses. So I think that whole thing about individual differences is really important to kind of be aware of it. Sorry, now I'll talk for too long. Um, the importance of meaning making, which you know, really comes from Robert Neymar and this whole thing about how do you fit this life event into what you believe already. And that's what brings us on to assumptions. The role of the continuing bond and what kind of bond is it going to be? And do we? I think we adapt over time. And I think that's what the, these theories are saying to us. And I think that's my own experience. People do generally adapt over time. And I think one thing we should remember about this because it's very important, it comes from Strieber's work in dual process, the idea of dosage and grief. <coughs> so even when someone's in with you for their 50 minutes or an hour, whatever amount of time you spend with them, they may be desperately sad during that time, but in fact, people often dose their grief, and they may spend that hour being very sad, but in fact, they may function very well outside of that hour. And we often don't know that as therapists or as, as, as psychologists. And I think we need to be aware of that. Because often people use that hour to come in and be really sad because that's their time to be like that. But in fact, may actually work and function quite well outside of that time. Um, and I guess one thing I've kind of, one belief I've come to myself over the years is this, that I think what we need to assess when we're looking at people who are at risk is how long does the grief last and how intense is it? Because every feeling is normal in grief. That's what the early theories tell us, and that's what the later theories tell us as well. Everything is normal in grief, but just what time is it happening at? What, where in this journey is this going to happen? And, and how long has it been there? How long have you, that person been angry for, or being sad, or can't function, or can't shop, or whatever it is they can't do? How long have they been like that? Because it's not the fact it's present, it's how much of it is there. That's what we really need to pay attention to. So just want to... I so suppose just about the, the later theories, I want to sound some notes, not caution, because I think Susan was saying to me there before the talk, in about 20 or 50 years, seven people, people look back at us and saying, did they really do that in the 1990s and the 2000s around that match, or this is where it's at now? So in the same way as we're kind of throwing dirty water and fried and bowl being parks and all the rest of it, we need to be careful because this is not a panacea, it's not the answer to all the questions. And class has uh, written some stuff in 2006 and more recently, again in Death Studies, it's a very good article, and it reminds us that continuing bonds does not guarantee beneficial outcomes. It's the kind of continuing, continuing bond we look at. It's not just enough to have it, because actually we could have a very negative continuing bond with somebody. We could actually be really relying on them and saying, relying on them in a way that's not good for us because we're not living in the present moment. A woman that was referred to me a long, long time ago uh, by her GP was referred because her son happened to call in while he was at six o'clock to see her. And she had two places set at the dinner table. And he said to her, Ma'am, did you know I was coming with you? And she said, No, that's for your dad. And dad had been dead for six months. And so the son got into an awful tizzy, brought off the GP who wanted to send her to psychiatry and probably admit her to hospital before the times of overcrowding in hospitals. And we had loads of beds in hospitals, which we don't have now. But anyway, he, he referred her to me and I started to work with her about what was the function of this. And she said something really amazing that wasn't a bit psychiatric or pathological. She said to me, if I didn't cook for the two of us, I wouldn't eat anything. And that's why I cook for the two of us. And when, I, when I'm when i ready, I won't, I'll only cook for myself. Absolutely perfect sense. And <laughs> I was going to say to her about all the poor children in Africa, as we thought they were really badly off at the time. But anyway, I didn't say that to her. But I, I just making the point that... You know, the, what looks like very pathological on the outside might might be pathological at all. And what looks like a good continuing bond might not necessarily be the best or only answer either. So we need to be careful and just stand back a bit. A more recent study by Field and Filanowski, is that the right pronunciation? Again, published death studies distinguishes between internalised, so for example, Im mental images of the person who died, and externalised expressions of continuing bonds like illusions the person is still alive, finding that only people who can have good internalised mental representations have good outcomes. So we need to be careful that like, continuing bond is not enough on its own. You think about what kind of continuing bond should that be or does it need to be challenged in some way. So I guess what I'm really saying is one size doesn't fit all. No one theory answers all our questions and one size of, of kind of approach is not going to work. I mean, that's why we need to be aware of what's out there. What do we know now? What can we say with some certainty? Because we, it's been applied to kind of bigger populations of people who are bereaved, who have different kinds of bereavements. What do we know about bereavement? And I guess what's really concerned me over the last five or ten years is that 
you know, in the same way as, as we kind of prioritise detachment, when I was tr- being trained first in the 1980s and the late 70s, and then detachment was a big buzzword, you know, get people to say goodbye, cut your ties, get on with your life. I don't think that was the right answer, and I don't think attachment or continuing bonds is necessarily the right answer on, it, on its own either, but it's certainly a step along that road. And I often think some people, people like prescriptive solutions because it helps them to feel in control. So on the way earlier on I was saying to you that one of the big things is people who are bereaved like to be in control. And maybe sometimes when they're told, this is what's going to happen to you. You are going to go through a stage of anger. You are going to be in denial for a while. You, shock is very normal. And you know, eventually over time things will get a little bit better. You know, all of that kind of stuff. Maybe that helps people to know that. So maybe education is something we've got to really think about doing. Just giving people the basic facts so they can make up their own minds about what works for them. And... <coughs> I want to say this because when I was thinking about doing this talk, I was thinking about kind of what do I think about bereavement now, and I think one of the functions of the older models, so that's that's Freud and Bowlby and Parks, where they talked about the stages of grief. I think it was to give meaning to some of the common behaviours in grief. So, for example, do the bereaved tell and retell their stories, which Neil Myers says is really an essential part of the grief process, not only to make sense of their loss, which is proposed by Neil Myers. That's how we do that but also as a way of compensating for the lack of physical presence of the deceased. Because maybe what they're doing is they're searching for that person. And by talking about what happened, they're not letting go of that image. And maybe that's keeping them very present. Because I think, ironically, and I often think about this about my clients I work with now, it's probably true to say that the majority of the bereaved people that I work with who have had reasonably intact relationships with the person who died are more intensely involved with them in the months after bereavement than they were when the person was alive. They actually think about them more. They think about them often incessantly, dream about them at night, wonder what they would say if they saw them now. So what is that about? Because that must have a function, whatever it is. I think it's really important for us to think about that because maybe that's the function, that it actually, oh, it's compensating for their lack of physical presence. And maybe that's what we're doing. We're, lo- we're really trying to be close to them. So what's the function of those thoughts, feelings and behaviours? Which I think is a, is a question that we need to think about. One of the common features across all the models that I talked about today, well, I suppose they have a description of grief common to all, that is the difficult emotions of grief, so ranging from uh, shock and sadness, obviously, frustration, um, uh, anger, resentment, relief sometimes, like my woman that I went to see the first day ever. And uh, I think the thing to say to clients is that everything is normal in grief, just how intense it is and how long has it been there. Maybe that's what we need to look at. I have come to the conclusion myself over time that in normal grief some type of confrontation of the reality of the loss is necessary that a person has to take on board the fact this loss is real and it has happened so denial as the only as the only or most real way of coping with grief is probably not really a good option I think from a psychological point of view and this thing that I truly believe which is that the relationship to the person who died is very important in deciding the outcome for me, it's all about relationship. And I think a lot of theories are saying that now. It's about what kind of relationship would they have that we have with the person who died. So I suppose towards a new theory of griefing, which is what we're trying to get to, and maybe one that encompasses all the kinds of people we meet, it's a shift towards ideographic approaches and away from stage models, which is, I suppose, I think is a good idea. The growth of qualitative research are really looking at very, and with smaller popula- populations of grieving people, but we look at them in very in-depth ways. And concepts that have come into vogue, such as making sense, resilience, and this forming or reforming a new identity without the presence of the, of the person who died. Adoption of non-pathological ways of viewing individual differences, so one size does not fit all. A focus on ways of continuing relationship with the deceased, but in a way that the bereaved want to do it. And the realisation that not everybody who's bereaved wants to have a continuing relationship. So this is not the only answer. A narrative model of grieving where you really allow clients to tell and retell their stories in the hope that in doing that they um, that they would make sense of their loss. And it's an active rather than a passive process. And this is one of the big things Nehemiah has brought to our understanding because Nehemiah said, says in one of his books, uh, I think it's Lessons, Lessons of Loss, Coping with that's kind of the name, but anyway, it's a very good book. It's, very, it's written like a manual. And one of the things he says in that book is that it, grief is a very active process. And it struck me when I read that first, what do you mean by it? But in fact, it is really active. Because, for example, 
when someone's going through the funeral ritual to decide when the person is going to be laid out and are they going to have a private funeral, are they going to have a cremation, what you know, what, what kind of way do they want it to be, what are the readings going to be, if there are going to be readings, what kind of ceremony do they want, are they going to have a month's mind mass or not have a month's mind mass and so on. Are they going to tell their children uh, that one parent is dying from cancer? All of those kind of things. It's very active. It is not a passive thing. We interact with loss all the time and we don't realise we're doing it. We actually decide very often how we're going to go through our own loss. <coughs> so what are the implications of kind of clinical practice? And the recommendations for practice in bereavement care can only be derived from empirically derived models of bereavement because evidence-based practice must be rooted in evidence-based theories. And that I truly believe that. For example, Sigmund Freud wrote his theory of grief and then when he had grief himself, particularly his daughter and his grandchild, it didn't work, but he, he couldn't separate his ties to his daughter because he loved her too much and he didn't want to let her go. That never really got the prominence in the literature to the got. So I think that's why I say about biases we went to it. I think it's very, very important that we not realise we must talk to big numbers of grieving people to actually know what it is that helps them and, and what also what doesn't help them. So in summary then, we can say that there are a range of theoretical models that can be used to explain the phenomena witnessed when observing the person is bereaved. The contribution of social and cultural influences is clear. And that's really important because I think you have to look at the context in which a bereavement happens. And the family both influence these and generally form a key source of support. And if they don't, if the family is not your key source of support, that leads to other problems. So how does the family function? What are the relationships like before the person died? That's obviously really important. And central to and most distinctive about newer perspectives is that when one is grieving, there is no compelling reason to let go or move on from either the deceased or, more importantly, aspects of that relationship that you want to carry on. And this uh, came home very forcefully to me because about 10 years ago, maybe maybe no, but more, but probably about 12 years ago, um, we were at home one Friday evening, relaxing after a hard week's work, as I saw it, and our daughter was upstairs, and she was about 12, maybe 13 or 14 at the time, and she came downstairs with her slippers and fell down 14 steps and hit the stairs where there were hard tiles at the bottom of it and basically went unconscious. And we were sitting in the kitchen, my husband and I, and I heard the thought and went out. She was lying out there and she was shaking, so she was having a bit of a seizure. So my husband said, get her into the car. We live about five minutes in the region hospital. When I was going down that car, I said in my head to my father, because I was extremely close to him, if you're up there, you better mind her because I couldn't cope with this. And that really strikes me because I think it's the thing about relationship. I didn't, I didn't pray to my mother, whom I was also quite close to, but for me, my father was always my closest relationship. And we came right back into vogue at that minute. It was him I prayed to or talked to or whatever I was going to do. And I think that's really important because you, we, we can keep those kinds of aspects of the relationship going if we choose to, if we want to or we need to. Um, so I think it's very important that we, we and letting go doesn't mean that we stop talking to somebody or we stop thinking about what would they think about that. Uh, but we certainly, it's a how we let them go and how we keep them that's really important. So I want to come back to this kind of central theme because this I suppose is a bit of what I think myself about personal theories. To me, in my work in bereavement for the last almost 30 years, I think the loss of core assumptions that we make about ourselves and the world is one of the major and overriding tasks in that it leads to all kinds of losses. So what is lost in bereavement? And the three assumptions by which we live our lives, I think they're lost temporarily in bereavement at least. That is predictability, because we all expect the world to be predictable and the way we want it to be. Control, because it makes us feel very out of control. And permanence, because intuitively, even though we all know in our heads we will not live forever, in some or other we feel we probably could live forever. So I think that is why redefining those assumptions is one of the core bits of work to be doing for real people. And people who fail to re be able to redefine and look at those assumptions, I think they're the people who really struggle in loss. So I think when we don't address those issue, that issue of core assumptions, it can mean the griever is unable to make sense of the loss because they can't move on in their grief because they can't let go of the fact this person shouldn't have died or this should not be happening to me or I can't control my life anymore and I really want to be in control. So... And that's why I say cognitive therapy has a role to play because the role of interpretations of bereavement response 
This can be one of the most important features in the bereavement response. How the bereaved choose to interpret what happens around them. So like I was saying, Glory Hunterford and the, and the White Feathers, when they are grieving, can have a significant impact on their response. Maybe that's a cop-out. Maybe that's our way of saying this loss doesn't really happen at all. They're just away from me and I can't see them. Maybe that's a great solace. I certainly believe one thing is a solace. And this, in my own research, this came out, and the people I work with now, it's certainly the feature of it. And that's the people who have a belief in some kind of afterlife or in some kind of level of spirituality or some kind of, that there's somebody greater than ourselves pulling the strings. I think those people over time tend to have an easier trip to the grief because I think they can make sense of it. They use their religious beliefs very often or their spirituality to make sense of the loss. And since CMR says, that's one of the central tests we're to do. Maybe that really supports people to do that. So maybe that's what, um, maybe that's the role of religion. Um, and certainly when I was doing my study, uh, people who had a strong sense of an afterlife or a sense of meeting the person who died again, they certainly had better outcomes in terms of lower levels of depression, better coping and lower le- levels of intense grief. So with that, now I'm coming to the end of it. So concluding the thoughts, how I suppose this is kind of the question that I might talk about. How do the bereaved learn to live with the deceased in their physical absence rather than their physical presence? And is that our task as bereavement support people? Do we have to bereave develop some way of accommodating this fundamental and sometimes overwhelming adjustment that they have to make? Is that really what we're about? And how do we actually set about doing that? So I think there are two questions. And I, I was thinking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and I thought, what are the essential needs of the bereaved and for me these are some of the essential needs that I think bereaved need and they need time to adjust because there's much too much of a rush now through through um, the whole bereavement landscape of this thing about even when you look at companies and organisations that gives people something like three or five days compassionate leave and you kind of think to yourself do they know actually what they're on about and I know we're living in times of economic crisis but I suppose the whole thing about this can be the biggest adjustment somebody ever has to make in their lives so I think the need for time the need for non-judgment, because for me that's really central. I think not to be judging what people are doing, because I think a lot of bereaved people feel very visible. They feel very judged by society, like that woman in the grave, the, with the, keeping the grave and not keeping the grave. I think the need for non-judgment is a very big thing to, to, to meet people in their journey of grief, where they're not judged. There should be a certain way, that there is one right way to be. They need to make sense, which I think Nehemiah is right about. I think there is a great need to make sense of this life event. And people who struggle to make sense, it seems to me, have a much longer journey to bereavement than those who can make sense more easily. The need for self-belief, the need in getting someone to believe in their gut instinct. And I think that's really important. Like the girl I worked with this morning who wants to go home and live at home for really valid reasons. She wants to be close to where her dad was before he died. But everyone else is judging, saying, you've got to become dependent. If you don't, you have to watch it. You need to be careful. I think we need to really encourage people to believe in themselves because we all know ourselves best and I think this need to continue the bond to the deceased or not in a way that makes sense to them so they might say I don't want to anything with that person who died like my woman that I talked about or they might say I really need to carry this person with me in some way and I do think people create legacies I think that's what we're doing now we're all creating a legacy I think people who died before us have left a legacy to us and how we're going to use that legacy is often the question for ourselves so, so the challenges are how do we help people cope with loss based on the theories that have just been true today? Should it be prescriptive or should it be do your do it yourself model where it's individual for everybody you meet? And I guess this thing about bias, you know, when do we have our own first losses? How were they dealt with? Um how much does that influence our work? What do we really believe about grief for ourselves? Because I think it's one thing. When I worked, I started my work life as a psychologist in 1982 in Roscommon Community Care, as I was in at the HSC today. And um, we were working only with children uh, under the age of 16, and we're mainly doing um, behavioural, children with behavioural difficulties and uh, learning, learning difficulties. And um, I wasn't married then, or maybe I was just about to get married, but now I didn't have children. And uh, went off to Bell and Lock, which is a tiny little village on the on the Mayo border with Roscommon, and this one gave her three children, all of whom were bedwetting. And of course, I had on my charts out and I had on my behaviour goals and all the rest of it. And she said, Before we start, I said, Do you have any children yourself? And I said, No, I don't. She said, What would you know about this, though? You wouldn't have a clue. And I was thinking, I said, One thing I can say about people bereavement is that I definitely have had losses if people ever asked that question nowadays. So I think it's one thing that's common to all of us.
they want to finish off with the good old Barak at the top, we should do something positive at the end. So if you're walking down the right path, I do think we're walking down the right path in bereavement, and you're willing to keep walking, you will eventually make some progress. So that's the end of the talk. Um, I'll just go down here because I have a, an email address there. If anyone wants to contact me, I'll send you a copy of the talk if anyone's interested or not bored to hear as this is. So um, I'll just leave it up there. It's helen.greely at cancercarewest.ie. Um, so you're very welcome to contact me and I'd be happy to send it to you. Um, so I just so I'll go back to these questions. I thought what I might do is, it's 25 past 6, so I spoke for half an hour longer than I planned to talk. For, but anyway, I thought I might just maybe go into groups, because it might be a good way of just getting a bit of discussion going. Just look at those questions and watch people just generate a bit of discussion about it. Maybe spend 15, 20 minutes talking about it and then come back and just have some concluding discussion about it. Is that okay with everyone? If you're happy to do that, maybe one person in the group would be the... the uh, would keep note of what's said and maybe bring it back to the to, to us then. Is that all right? Yeah. I think that's your Yeah. Alright, if somebody wants to ask a question and you don't want to go into groups, I'm quite happy to discuss do, it now too. Do you want, do you want to check and see if we've got questions? Yeah, but has anyone got questions? It's going to get a glass of water. Yeah, please, I'm sorry to the form. <laughs> Yeah, about 33 percent need some kind of help, but not maybe bereavement therapy. Maybe something like a support group, bereavement support group. So it's maybe less intense feelings of loss. But of that 33 percent, about 15 percent, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of all grieving people have some kind of complicated grief that usually requires one-to-one -one therapy. So that's kind of the new, but the new research is telling us now. Yeah, so it's quite it's a size. Sorry. Seems yeah, but I suppose in a way it's one third. But they they were talking about things like bereavement support groups and stuff like that. So it might not be really intense one to one work. It might be just they need some kind of support. I mean, I suppose traditionally as well they would have got it over the garden wall or maybe in a confession or something, and it's changed a lot. So maybe that's also added to it. But there is there is a size of proportion of people who do need some kind of ongoing support.
um, and often the question that you need to ask is how can I help you now? Yeah. And that often, and maybe that kid would say, you can't help me, you don't want so much. And that's perfectly fine too. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe work with the mother of her own, if that's an option. Sometimes maybe it might, might be, maybe she needs to talk about yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, but and I, I'm also uh, some bit reluctant about family therapy with kids at that age because mm-hmm. I think you know the very guard of all the things yeah. up. So I think maybe you won't get to the finer mm-hmm. details of what the bereavement like for them individually. Mm-hmm. Um, I think bereavement is a very personal thing, mm-hmm. and it can often be often grief with family therapy. It's very different thing to be doing. So I think sometimes you know. So is that is the therapy to work with you? It's not for breathing, it's for anything. It, it, they were referred because this, I suppose that um, he was struggling at school, and so he actually came from the principal of his school. And um, and at the start, when I was asking them what they'd like, it was kind of communication that they, they felt that they, well, the man was in particular thought that they were kind of each coping separately, and she kind of felt that she was losing them a little bit and trying to build it. Build it. Uh, so sometimes I think what happens, if you have, what, what can be helpful if you have something like that happen, is that it's often to have just one event a week or a month where the family comes together and have a dinner or something mm-hmm. like that. It can often be very powerful because m- maybe that kid just isn't willing to talk about whatever yeah. he means. Because he doesn't know what it means for him. He's still learning what it means for the mm-hmm. opposite dad and his uncle. So I just, I just would be very, I think it's quite difficult to work with something like that. Mm-hmm. Right, probably more, doesn't mean I'd probably say, Oh, but this kid is on with the organ hours, and so maybe that's what he needs. I don't know. Uh, but I just think sometimes family therapy can be very much kind of very different to kind of negotiate. So, do you have any assessment of the kind of seminar in the 10 year old boy was referred to me from the HSB um, because his father was having suicide and he was having behavior problems at school? But I saw him over a period of like two weeks, two months, and we hadn't talked about it at all, to be honest with you. And I decided to bring it up one day, and he just got the whole session crying, saying nothing, and it turned out he didn't want to come back. Mm-hmm. So I just concluded, I just said in fact that he's really not ready for therapy, he's mm-hmm. been pushed into it, mm-hmm. and he doesn't, not able, he might need to, but he's not able to talk about it. Mm-hmm. That is not to give him a bad experience mm-hmm. of therapy, yeah. Yeah. anything he needs to do back in yeah. the age yeah. yeah. You know that girl I spoke about, who said I'd be the geek whose parents separated? Mm-hmm. Like I saw her for a year, and she wouldn't really talk about the weather. And about her school friends, and about she was talking very little about her brother. Actually, this huge event happened with the parents of my sisters, and then she talked about all of it. But I mean, I used to say to myself, there's a push on to talk about the senior from that kid's mm-hmm. thing. And I did in a sense that, you know, I knew that they, their relationship was in trouble, and that she might well need to come back. So I was, so I just, you know, it drove me crazy because I was dying to talk about that thing, what it was like for her. Mm-hmm. But it, I think that, I mean, that's one big rule, even in cancer care, I think people who work with some of the world, Maybe face their own thing because you have to be faced with the person you're seeing. So I think it's really important. Thank you. Try and So you have you could do the I think you're doing just fine on the Thanks, Do you want to ask something? Yes, I thought a hard question. <laughs> comment, but you might have, or somebody else might have, is that they're very interested in what you're saying about continuing bonds, and you know how it, it was the new thing, mm-hmm. and everyone was to have continuing bonds, now that they weren't to have closure anymore, mm-hmm. you know, again being prescriptive, and now we're starting to look at, is it always a good mm-hmm. idea? And I suppose the niggle I have at the moment is, is really around use of, of internet, particularly I think with adolescents, and some of the memorialising websites, mm-hmm. and how that's going to play out around continuing bonds. Because it can almost be as if the person isn't dead, mm-hmm. yeah. you know. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, that's part of what you were talking about. And I think it's just more that of thinking it, it'll be interesting to see what happens. And I think what the newer stuff is saying, there was one issue there that is dedicated there to continue about the budget, I don't know, but a year ago, I think. And like one of, one of the kind of more critical things in Boston was being said was that, you know, it, it's all about individual differences. So like, it, it, isn't, it isn't just the existence of the bond. Like, how do you do that in a healthy way? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think we've lost that. Cause, uh, and I think the reason we all rushed to say break up being bad is because I think it's the new big thing about fixing for all our clients and we want to fix them. Because they still want to do the same thing with Freud and what they all left one do is just take away people suffering. Why do GPs prescribe antidepressants for a reason? Because they want to take away that pain and give them nothing. I mean, we all have to look at those things. 
بلکه سوس خاطر که به نظر جان رو بیدن از منتر هم شما میگوشت از این کرمین نبان به نظر شما که ما فرد و داری فرد باشت اکسی داشت and he was also sort of intrigued with your saying you know are do bereaved people like the stages of, of grief period because it's a sense of control or predictability yes. and mm-hmm. maybe isn't that also true for us as service yeah, providers yeah. wouldn't we also yeah. like that and isn't the challenge to yeah. sit with someone without yeah. your handy bag of tricks I think the stage is something to offer as well because the problem is use them as a prescription in the sense that somebody being labelled with pathology they don't go through them. Because of course you know what as a normal yeah. is people go through grief. But the idea that we have to go through all of them in a certain way is what disadvantages them. And that means describing them is very important and that people would know it is normal grief to be very sad or to be angry sometimes but it's maybe you know, you don't <laughs> work with them only once and she was thinking she said, I come to you now she said, I won't read them here and you better tell me uh, am I okay? Uh, my friend and my family have all said to me, I should be angry. And I've been angry when my husband died and I have peace in heaven. And we've gone to good man and I think worried about Mary Eve and only by name. She's very religious lady. And I just want to know, am I going to get angry in five years' time? Can you tell me all that you can? Like, I, I want to know, should I get angry? And that's why she said, because she's raised something like one of the way. You have to go through a phase of anger. And uh, she never went to anything because she was not to And that's and it is out there sort of in the ether yeah. isn't oh, it yeah. now you hear it on the Simpsons or yeah. you know, if you've lost your job you go through these yeah. stages yeah. of grief yeah. anybody want to ask anything else yeah. Yeah. do you feel like having a discussion on your own with I maybe just make a comment I'm not a sex therapist yet I'm only in training and I'm also doing a course on logotherapy which is Victor Frankl's healing with meaning and he talks a lot about making sense mm-hmm. um, of the suffering or uh, de- death or loss so um, just it kind of intersects with what you were saying to make sense of, of, of the loss uh, and death is extremely important for a lot of people and once they find the meaning in that death, they can get on with life after that. Mm-hmm. And I can see a lot of examples of that, you know, with um, people who lost their loved one to, say, cancer, and they start raising money, or they find, uh, they start a foundation for the cause that is connected to the circumstances mm-hmm. of death, for example. So, um, it's just... And I mean, it's only really good example that the amount of pain to these children have to write something or have some kind of remembrance because they're terrified the child is a bit forgotten about. Mm-hmm. And I think that's their effort to try and make sense of it because they leave a negative. Yeah, there are lots of examples. I mean, for example, I would think after the, my old teacher asked me in Dublin in October, I used my first lecture with Albert in Dublin, I would use the example of Diana when she died. And there were no reasons, but there were lots of reasons for the world all that for point of view. But two of the reasons, one was that no one could make sense of it happening to someone who was so young. So talented, so protective, so this, that, and the other, and then like, suddenly she was there to grab the day for it, or find the life of the world for people. But then it was that was a great national outpouring, because people could cry, pretend they were crying for her, and in fact, I think people crying about their own lives, yeah. but they had no permission to do it. So I think those kinds of big, well known people who die often trigger off those kind of responses, because mm-hmm. we're really struggling to make sense of it. I think it makes everyone feel very unsafe mm-hmm. in the short term. And, uh, Yes, so that's something that we all have to open the room or tell us what it all means. So that question going on in Paris, it's working with clients all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I think. Well, the other thing was that, uh, for example, there's a lot of research coming from positive psychologists mm-hmm. um, saying that the um, people who coping, who show better coping skills do engage in making, finding meaning yeah. in, in, in what happened to them. You see, again, that's about interpretation. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think the role of interpretation of grief has been completely underestimated. Mm-hmm. I think it's really important in terms of deciding what the outcome is going to be. Because if you choose to interpret, like the couple that I was quoting, the man could see signs from his own network and the woman could see his own. Same things are happening to students, they could see the interpretation of the that's really important in terms of kind of helping us to, you know, you know. I, mean, I, I just have the sense that we don't, and that's why I work as a common therapist, and that's often myself, 
and so on, having drugs to use and probably resonates with me more. So I always think of a way to how this person may get the answer to that. And that'd be interesting. Mm -hmm. and that'd be interesting. Yeah. Can I just add a note of skepticism? Uh, I think sometimes there is no meaning. And we have to accept that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we need to be very, very careful. Um, and I think that uh, your point is well made about the place of religion and probably the evolution of religion. If you go back to very ancient times and the Sumerians and the Egyptians, I mean, religion was very, very much caught up with the afterlife and of course the whole Christian faith and so forth. Uh, so that's just one point. Um, the other point I would make is one needs to be very careful as well in the research literature around positive psychology and a lot of the health psychology literature which is actually uh, putting forward the idea that uh, those with a spiritual stroke religious bent cope better. The majority of that research actually comes from the United States which is a very fundamentalist Christian society. So I think we, you know, as, as scientists, mm -hmm. practitioners, we have to be very sceptical and we have to be very critical of sampling and the, 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 the actual personnel who kind of put themselves forward and uh, contribute to the large scale studies. Some of them actually not so large scale. The other thing I would say as well is that if you actually... Um, I know people tend to kind of pass over the results section of, of, and the methodology section and go from the introduction to the discussion, as I have frequently myself. But actually, if you do take time and look at the methodology and results section, a lot, a lot of this stuff is very, very questionable from a research perspective. Yeah. So I just throw that out yeah. just to be controversial. Just 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 my interest of I just when, you, when people don't make sense, when you can't make sense, what do you think happens to people who are bereaved? Or do you think they become part of the complicated grief group? Well, I honestly don't know. I don't think so, no. I mean... Do, do, but do they just say, I can't understand this, and I never will understand it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just have to accept yes, it. Said, yes, I think uh, in, in, in some... In, there's often a reason for things happening, but there mightn't be a meaning. You know, people kind of could struggle with the well, what's, what's the meaning of it? And then maybe there is no meaning. But isn't that I mean, I'm, I'm pushing this now to the, mm -hmm. you know, I'm being, yeah. very, you know, being very controversial about this, you know. But um, I mean, in a way, that's an act of choice as well. Because actually, they, they, they make a choice, they, well, I there is no so. meaning. Yes, so yes. I think it's very much bound up with our own personal yeah. philosophy that, well, look, there are, you know, they, they kind of, act, I suppose, to a large extent, accept that there are a lot of things in the world that we don't understand and there are a lot of things that happen and we don't have reasons for them and I'm willing to kind of live with that uncomfortableness and it just so happens that what's happened to me this murder or this accident or whatever uh, I'm struggling to understand it and maybe it comes into the category of those things for which there, there are really reasons really, really to uh, meaning or I can't get meaning for it and I'm maybe I need to work along those lines. Or maybe if that's, that's one man of meaning and another man of choice. <laughs> because <laughs> I think they're quite polar what you're saying. Like we're talking about it's not finding the meaning, it's finding something that you can live with that's exactly it's exactly meaning yeah. 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 which is which is it's meaning yes. making rather than yeah. meaning finding. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 It's not making, you know, yeah. Yeah. something that you can live with. That it's not something that's philosophy. there. It no. does not exist, you know. Yeah. And I, I personally struggle, yeah. you know, when when I read about the examples of the, the actual meaning that people find in the suffering and I'm struck by thinking, Oh my God, I mean this is so <laughs> not true, you know, to me, you know. It, <laughs> and, and it's made up, completely made up, but it's it's made up and it makes them feel better. It it somehow comes mm -hmm. helps them. And it goes back so to their potential functions. Yeah, yeah it is yeah. functions for them. Functions for them yeah. somehow. But I think one can find meaning mm -hmm. uh, do the meaning making by accepting that things some things are not controllable. Mm -hmm. A lot of things are mm -hmm. most things are permanent, everything is not permanent. Mm -hmm. 
and that's what the and predictable and things are predictable, you know, and that in itself is meaning making. Yeah, I, think, yeah. I, I think finding the spirituality in yeah. terms of yeah, I I agree. I, I had skepticism as it were with regard to yeah. people who feel like there's an afterlife or that they're going to meet the person again in some other life and all that kind of thing. I would see that as a very cultural. And it's kind of form denial because it's like saying it's like form denial. Yeah, because it's like it's not really. I think it's a cultural. It's a temporary. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's interesting what you're saying there about predictability and, and so on and, and control because it's, it's this study in the States called the American Change in Life Study, study which is one of the biggest, it's about 5,000 people in it, and looking at kind of responses to bereavement. And it was a, um, they had a, a pre bereavement sample, and so everybody was listening to the sample and then they waited to see who was going to be bereaved. So they had pre bereavement measures and post bereavement measures, but it's very good sign. One of the things that came out of that, one of the first waves of the study, found that people who um, kind of showed their shoulders and said, What would be, would be, did better. Because they would it's accept, to be like what you're saying, yeah. they could accept this is the way it is, and I, I, and I, I, don't, I, I, I don't really understand it, but I accept it. So yeah. I mean, there, there is some, you know, I mean, I, 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 so I go back to my basic premise, which is that I think. Grief is a very individual response, and that's why when we work with people, what we do is we have guidelines in our heads about because we look great stuff or we work with lots of people. But at the end of the day, it is really about this person's interpretation of that. Mm-hmm. And that is really very well left for me. Um, but I, I, I would have to say, though, I, mean, I don't know if my study was well designed or not, but the response in my study, while just both over the four years of the study or three years of the study, was in effect people who did have strong religious beliefs did have better outcomes and maybe that's because they were in denial or because they were kept from that culture that was you know, predominantly Catholic mm-hmm. groups that were in it. Um, so, but uh, it seems to me that any people I work with now, I mean I work with people who have no religion and who have very strong sense of religion and belief in the afterlife and it takes a while for that to kick in. So in the beginning the religion might be a big part of the story but as time goes on they use it to make sense of what's happened. Because I wouldn't be doing that the first year because it's too raw or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's not important or it might be angry at God or whatever it is they believe in. So I think it's a very much individual story. So I mean, some of the you know, you know, you think Freud was paid for 1980 and here we are almost as 2018. Are we any further on really? <laughs> <laughs> so we knew originally. But isn't it sometimes our job also to, to challenge the meaning making? I mean, not an, an unusual scenario is maybe a woman of 24 saying, well, I know one my child died because I had an abortion when I was 16. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes our job is, maybe she had that all figured, yeah. here's her meaning making, yeah. but I would see it as part of my job to challenge that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we can't just sort of sit complacently and say, well, if that works for you. Yeah. We used to say with the Kennedys in America, oh, well, that was bad money they made, that's why they had all that bad <laughs> luck. It's a way of saying, so it won't happen to me. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, but sometimes the meaning making, like the continuing bond, may not be functional. And that's our job too. Yeah. I mean, that couple I talked about was Charlie Smith and Harmax. And one of the really traumatic things, and one of the things I think that it was a kind of final straw in terms of the relationship was that um, these children, this boy who died was about 10 or 11, and his sister was maybe about 9 or 10, which were two years old. But the year before the kid was killed in the accident, um, the mother had got pregnant unexpectedly. And she was heading into her like, early 40s and became pregnant and they decided to go to medical termination. The first day they came to me, they never told anybody about this, and the most of them know about you would say to them, the punishment because yeah. they had this termination. Mm-hmm. And they completely used that to make sense of their grief. And even though obviously I didn't really believe that, but for them it took about three years for that to change in terms of the thing that they do. But they completely made sense of it using a very negative life mm-hmm. and it was not really in their place because it was intended to. Uh, you know, you know, just for that. So, but they, that's how they chose this place for being punished. And then it shifted, Helen, is that what you said? Well, no, no, yeah, they, it shifted over time. And, it could, and it, one of the things about that particular couple was that the father was very, very guilty because of the nature of the accident, because he was with the film that happened. And he had a particular expertise in the farming of the child film. It's like a big circle I saw. And the father believed that it's only James when he was working. And he had to turn off the air because the sheep and the child from the house instead of the surgery was let out. But he was very guilty and 
guilty of publicly charging trauma services. The director was done, but also guilty of the very dumb for the police house for his wife and daughter and the whole family. And one day, I must have been reading Robin Neymar at the front, and I said, What's the function of your grief? And Robin Neymar said, That's when you're doing grief at the front. And he said, I said, What's the function of your guilt? And he said, My guilt is here to stop me ever enjoying life again. Because I don't deserve to enjoy life, and that's why I got to be guilty. And for him, that's an important thing. And we did that hope that, and actually, he shifted in the end. He actually wanted to leave the marriage, but he said, This marriage was never good. I mean, we'd never, we'd say it's done, and we'd have to move on. And he, and he did in some ways, because his daughter wouldn't have to go to separation. I, I think that was too late to bunch of people. I don't hear a lot of appetites in the But I love that you can hear much. the questions mm-hmm. starting to yeah. spark. Yeah. And so, on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank you very yeah. much. Helen, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. presenting the information and then your ability to weave in your own practice wisdom and your own personal experience and that's what all of us bring to the work and um, so thank you i think you kicked off the series very well for us <laughs> we hope you'll come back next week that is john mcavoy down there playing yes, yes. i'll come next week john Thanks, I'm not great. Is that okay? Yeah, well, are you happy with this? Yeah.